I'm Francis Dernley, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you news from the front lines. Analyze further pledges of support for Kyiv by Western allies as the world reacts to events unfolding in the Middle East and assess the significance of Russia's most advanced tank being destroyed on the battlefield and what that means for the tank war. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody's gonna break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Wednesday, the 11th of October, one year and 229 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today I'm joined by our Associate Editor of Defence, Dominic Nichols, our Brussels correspondent, Joe Barnes, live from the NATO summit where Zelensky has been speaking, and former tank commander and a man with extensive experience in the Middle East, Hamish de Breton Gordon. I started by asking Dom for the latest from the front lines. Well, hi, Francis. Hi, everybody. So, yesterday, Russian forces launched a number of small offensive operations across uh, some areas of the front. Firstly, go to the east round Donetsk City, and you've got Avdivka, which is about 5Ks north of, of Donetsk City itself. Number of small offensive operations to the north and south of Avdivka. And then further west around that line of control, nearer where Ukraine uh, is having most success pushing into the pushing south. So this is southwest of Orokhiv, western Zaporizhia, Oblast. So on the western flank of the salient that's heading down towards Tokmak. So that would be Ukraine's right flank as they look at it. Institute for the Study of War are saying that this these actions by Russia are likely intended to try to fix Ukrainian forces away from that area in the southwest that's having the most success. However, geolocated footage from yesterday suggests Ukraine had made small advances in in that area to the west. Um, Contradicting that, Russian mill bloggers claim that Russian forces had advanced up to two kilometres in the area southwest of Orokhiv. There's no way to verify their claim, but the geolocated footage does sort of speak for itself. And Ukrainian general staff confirmed that up to three Russian battalions conducted the attack in the Avdivka direction. Now, that's not going to be a huge number of people. A battalion probably, or I should have, about you know, five, 600 people. They are, they built slightly differently depending on the role. And, of course, Russia has taken a huge number of casualties. So quite how many uh, men are in those, in those battalions. But even if there's three battalions of, say, 500 each, that's still not a huge number of uh, people to try and affect the front line. Now, Russian mill bloggers are largely portraying that Avdivka area operation as a, a significant offensive uh, aimed at trying to encircle Avdivka and encircle the Ukrainian force holding holding or in that area uh, and to try to retake the city. But ISW is saying that, that, that Avdivka is one of the most heavily fortified areas of the Donetsk Oblast front line and a successful encirclement of it would very likely require many, many more forces than Russia has currently dedicated to it as i say if, if it's the maximum let's say 1500 people or you know go mad and say there's 2000 that's really not not a lot around there geolocated footage from yesterday also suggests minor advances along the, the line of contact further to the southwest between donetsk and vilidar uh, but by both sides so some some geolocated footage suggests ukraine has advanced um, in a minor way some has just russia has so uh, it's still very 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 busy around there um, not a huge amount of, uh, not a huge number, of, uh, not a huge change in the line. Now, finally, from me, earlier today, Ukraine's security service, the SBU, has named two Ukrainian men. They say have been acting as uh, Russian collaborators who allegedly worked with Russian forces to carry out the October fifth attack on Groza, the death death toll from which has gone up this morning to fifty five. So, in a post on Telegram. The SBU announced that they are in pursuit of the individuals. They're two brothers that I'm not going to name for legal reasons, but they're in their 20s and 30s. They're both locals from Kharkiv Oblast. Allegedly began working with Russian forces when they when Russia took control of the area. This is per the SBU. Following the liberation of the region in late last year, the brothers went to Russia 
continued to work with Russia and created a network of local informants and other contacts with whom they stayed in touch. Use those contacts to identify Ukrainian troop movements or gatherings, which they gave to uh, to their Russian controllers. And the SBU said they often used unwitting informants, just chatting, seemingly asking innocent questions to hide their in- intentions. Now, the SBU are saying they're alleging that the brothers explicitly worked to gather information about the memorial service for Andre Kozier, who was being reburied in Groza on, the, on October the 5th when the, uh, uh, the Iskander missile struck. Um, and they're suggesting, the SBU is suggesting that... Um, these two brothers supply the information, the details to Russian forces, likely knowing full well that what was going to what was going to happen. So that was breaking as of this morning. Reports out of out of Ukraine from the SBU, and I'll take a little pause there, Francis. Well, thank you very much for that, Dom. Joe, you're calling us live from the NATO summit in Brussels, where President Zelensky has made a surprise visit. What are you hearing, first of all? Hi, yeah, so um, sort of a real. Well, not a real shock. We, so we, we first heard rumours of uh, President Zelensky was travelling to Brussels early this morning. So as we sort of build up to these meetings, and this meeting is a meeting, a fairly standard one of three every year of NATO defence ministers. So uh, before these meetings, I go around, I speak to various NATO officials and member state or ally representatives. And no one at any point suggested that President Zelensky would be rocking up in the Belgian capital today. So normally his international visits, so like I was reporting from Granada last week, I had good word that he was going to attend a week or two before that. But today, nothing. So President Zelensky hasn't directly referenced why he's in, in Brussels today, apart from attending what was his first Ramstein format. That's the group of around 50 Ukrainian allies who help coordinate military aid to Ukraine, and he attended for the first time in person. He's also met the Belgian Prime Minister, which we can talk about a bit later, because I know you're going to speak about jets, Francis. But yeah, so why he's made no real reference of why he's appearing, what seems to be the building consensus is that he's here because there is a feeling that Ukraine's defence against the Russian invasion could be impacted by what is happening in Israel. And very much so in the domain of weapons deliveries. So this is what Zelensky told France 2 earlier. He said there is a risk that international attention will turn away from Ukraine and that we will have and that will have consequences. And then he's just been giving a press conference uh, downtown in Brussels um, as he meets uh, Belgian Prime Minister Alexander de Croo and he he told reporters there, I ask our partners, will your support be less than now? The partners said no, but who knows? And then he said, of course, everyone is afraid and Russia is counting on dividing support. So, yeah, that brings around the real question is whether is there enough global stock to supply both Israel and Ukraine in high intensity conflict? Um, so obviously there's vast differences between Israel and Ukraine. One is sort of one of the world's leading militaries with sort of high, most high tech air defense systems in the world and sort of an, a great example of a modern military. The other is a country that's developed into a fantastic military, but still requires a vast amount of support from the West to bring it up to scratch in terms of becoming NATO standard, as we always say. So the one of the issues I think that it drills down to, is there enough air defence stocks in the world to give to both or give or sell to Israel or and Ukraine? So the US has said that new air defence assistance to Israel is on the cards, and officials in Washington are bullish that they are capable of supplying both Israel and Ukraine, and have con- but have conceded there are some challenges. And so I think we've got to remember that Israel is a long-term recipient of US military aid, so this is not sort of a new issue arising. But that is one of the models the West is looking at for Ukraine in the future. So when Ukraine has sort of received these plans for, and they're being negotiated at the moment, memorandums of understanding on various security security guarantees in the long-term future. That is based on the Israel model that the US basically commits to X amount of spending every year on increasing Israel's military capabilities. We'll stop there. Well, thanks, Joe. It's been very interesting, I think, seeing the commentary coming out of the US this morning. Lloyd Austin saying that uh, we'll continue to support Ukraine for as long as it takes and then making a further pledge of $200 million in a military package, clearly keen to underline that support is not going to go away. But as you say, the political reality of this is that attention is being drawn away from Kiev and there may well be consequences of that. But it does seem, as you say, that 
the allies this morning of Kyiv are very, very keen to drum home that this changes nothing at present. But Joe, just on one other issue that's erupted this morning, this row over the apparent sabotaging of an undersea gas pipeline between Finland and Estonia. What's the context of this and how's it going down where you are? Look, so yes, there's been this this sort of this pipeline was destroyed and Finland has claimed it's an outside actor. But Finland's representatives to NATO, so they were the 31st NATO ally that joined, I think, officially in April. They um, they briefed other NATO allies yesterday and said, look, while it's we, we, we consider it's not an not a sort of a malfunction of the pipe. There has been an explosion of some sort. They said it was too early to commit to whether saying it was sabotage, a deliberate act of sabotage, or whether it was potentially an accident. And what one of the things that they stressed in this meeting of the North Atlantic Council, which is the sort of the governing body of NATO, is that 90% of undersea infrastructure, whether it be cables or pipelines, are damaged by fishing trawlers. So they are definitely saying it's too early to sort of speculate on whether there has been a deliberate act of sabotage. But I think it's fair to say uh, Russia and Vladimir Putin have both threatened consequences against Finland for its joining of NATO. And it's possibly at a time where Vladimir Putin thinks and knows that the West's kind of eyes are distracted from various things because they're looking at Israel, they're looking at what's happening in Nagorno-Karabakh between Armenia and Azerbaijan. They're looking at they're looking at Ukraine. They're looking at other various instabilities around the world and actually saying, can we get away with doing a little bit more in terms of whether it be little covert sabotage missions or just sort of psyops to disrupt elections or other things, whether it be fake news. It's just the, the basically current geopolitical context around the world has opened up a space where Russia thinks it can do more. And that is what has given rise to these sort of allegations that Russia is behind the attack. Well, thank you very much for that, Joe. As you say, it comes as no surprise that Zelensky has made this surprise visit. As you say, the world's attention is in danger of slipping away, at least in the short term, despite the fact that the war in Ukraine is for now of a totally different magnitude. It's important to remember that. I mean, hundreds of thousands have been killed, we believe, in Ukraine and tens of thousands of civilians severely injured. But looking beyond Europe in the political realm, I spoke at length on Monday about the potential implications of Hamas's attack for both Russia and Ukraine. So I won't repeat myself here, but there remains a lot of discussion since then about the degree of Russian responsibility for destabilising the Middle East with its open support of Iran and dealings with Hamas. For a bit of history, since the Soviet era, the Russian intelligence services have worked with Palestinian terrorist groups as a means of undermining Western influence in the Middle East. And the relationship with Iran was bolstered in the wake of the uprising against Assad in Syria a few years ago, which was, of course, brutally put down by Iran's forces and proxies fighting alongside Russian allies, including the Wagner Group, which we've spoken about at length many times. They are unsurprisingly seeking to leverage these events for their own ends. The former Russian uh, president, Dmitry Medvedev, has been tweeting since the events of the weekend and says it shows how the US and its allies should have been working to resolve the Israel-Palestinian conflict instead of interfering, his word, and supplying military support to Kyiv. Now, I hesitate to draw a straight line between Russia's relationships with Iran and Hamas and these attacks. We simply do not know the extent of their knowledge and involvement. But President Zelensky is keen to emphasise the connection. He's put out a statement saying the following. We have data very clearly proving that Russia is interested in inciting war in the Middle East so that a new source of pain and suffering would erode global unity and exacerbate cleavages and controversies, helping Russia in destroying freedom in Europe. We can see Russian propagandists gloating. We can see Moscow's Iranian friends openly extending a helping hand to those who attacked Israel. All of this represents a much greater threat than the world is currently aware of. The world wars of the past were triggered by local aggressions. We know how to counter this threat. We've already prepared the necessary steps and our primary goal is to protect the need for maximum global unity. Now, 
one could argue that, of course, President Zelensky would say that. But in his defence, this doesn't scream to me of political opportunism, as the Ukrainians have really been making this argument ever since the full scale invasion, namely that Russia, especially a Russia at war, would mobilise all of its resources to destabilise regions in which it has influence. As an aside, I think it's also worth remembering that nothing nothing happens in isolation. The success of battlefield drones in Ukraine, for instance, may have inspired Hamas to utilise them to such devastating effect in their attack on Israel. We've all seen the footage. If Russia's invasion hadn't happened or had been stopped earlier, one has to ask, would those drones now be out there? So I think it's important to just think about the ways in which these things can be either directly or indirectly connected. But turning to other political matters that Joe hasn't already covered, yesterday the UN uh, General Assembly voted against Russia rejoining the UN Human Rights Council more than a year after it was kicked out amidst its uh, evidence of human rights abuses by Russian forces. Russia needed at least 97 votes from 192 countries voting in order to rejoin the Human Rights Council. It received, we understand, 83 votes, meaning that Bulgaria and Albania assume the seats available on Eastern European seats of that council. So Bulgaria got 160 and Albania 123. Obviously, this will come as a relief to Western officials and officials at the UN. The optics would have been beyond terrible if Russia had been reappointed onto that council. But the first thing one thinks when hearing those numbers is which countries exactly voted for Russia to rejoin the Human Rights Council. Now, unfortunately, we don't know, as it was a secret ballot. But Russia claims it speaks for the silent majority, which may not be true. After all, they didn't win this vote. But nevertheless, there will be concern that they are working effectively in the back halls, making promises, striking deals that are keeping them diplomatically in play with a lot of other world powers. But anyway, staying on Russia, we learn that Putin will visit Kyrgyzstan on Thursday in what is believed to be his first known trip abroad since the International Criminal Court, the ICC, issued a warrant for his arrest back in March. It's not been confirmed by the Kremlin yet, but according according to Kyrgyzstan, Putin will take part in ceremonies dedicated to the 20th anniversary of the opening of an airbase in Kant, which is home to the Russian Aerospace Force's 999th airbase. And whilst we're on the subject of planes, Joe mentioned it a moment ago, Belgium have said it will send F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine from 2025. The, that comes from the country's defence minister on local radio this morning. And the Dutch have also confirmed today that they will make their first deliveries at the end of 2024 as scheduled. So that coalition of fighter jets we've spoken about so many times is gathering pace But obviously the pace will be an immense frustration to Kyiv. Had the green light been given when they first asked for it, then they wouldn't have had they would have had them for the counteroffensive and wouldn't have to now be waiting and adapting their plans accordingly. And as I say, this is still a long way away as far as the the Dutch contribution and the Belgian contribution go. We're expecting they might get some earlier from other sources, but again, not guaranteed. So we really are looking at the earliest in the latter half of 2024 until those F-16s reach Kyiv. So that's where we are on the political realm today on Ukraine matters. We're very happy to be joined again at Telegraph Towers by Hamish de Breton Gordon, regular on the podcast, of course, former tank commander and someone with extensive experience in the Middle East, as we've talked about many times. We're going to come back to Ukraine in a moment. But Hamish, since we've got you, this is obviously the first time you've been on since the terrible events that took place over the weekend. You're somebody who's worked extensively in Syria where atrocities were and still are committed frequently. Did this surprise you? And I wonder, we're reading some speculating this morning about a degree of Syrian involvement. Where do you stand on that? Yeah, hi. Good afternoon, Francis. Good afternoon, everybody great to be at HQ headquarters um, for a rare visit. Yeah, a- absolutely. I, th- I think the first thing to consider, that there are already reports of Sil- Syrian artillery attacks on Israeli positions in and around the Golan Heights. I might, might say Syria has responded uh, in kind and, and with more. Um, we also know that Hezbollah from Lebanon have also been firing missiles I- into northern Syria. Um, the former 
uh, as in Syria, very much under the direction still of the Russians. I think Assad is still very much Putin's put- puppet uh, and Hezbollah, Iran, all who look to gain. I think the key thing about any harassing attacks in uh, northern Israel by potentially the Syrians uh, and Hezbollah is very much to give the Israelis, the IDF, lots to think about. And uh, Putin and the Russians, I think, very much want the Americans focusing on Gaza rather than the Crimea, really sort of backing up Zelensky's visit to NATO that Joe has been describing earlier on. In the past, Israel has made strategic strikes into Syria, very well known back back 10, 15 years ago, taking out the Syrian nuclear weapons program. Uh, And also during the time when Syria was using a lot of chemical weapons, again, sort of unilaterally away from the rest of the Western world, who sort of pretty much sat in their hands, taking out some key places. So I think Assad knows this. And I, I'm pretty sure that people have spoken to him or made it quite clear that if he gets any more or gets directly involved in this conflict, then he might well find that his beloved palaces and everything else in Damascus uh, might well be raised to the ground. And as Assad is welcomed back into the international community by a few, um, I expect that will be the last thing on his mind. I think also, the, the Syrian military, from what I've seen of them, absolutely no match for the Israelis. Lots of talk, um, and I'm sure you've covered it in in the pod recently. I wrote a little bit about it in the paper yesterday about the the, the training of of Hamas, um, which looks uh, very much um, as though it's been done by a sort of first rate uh, military. You know, some of their operations don't that we saw on Saturday didn't look any different from perhaps a special forces unit from a, you know, a first world nation. People have suggested the Syrians might be involved. From my experience, absolutely not. They just they, they are not that professional, don't have that capability. Much more likely, I expect, Iranian special forces. So I don't think they're going to get more involved, but I'm sure they're being encouraged by the Russians and the Iranians to harass in any military operation. You want to focus your aim and focus your end states and your targets. If you've got lots of distractions, it makes life that much more difficult. So I think that's what the Syrians and Hezbollah are up. And just before I finish, I'm sure in the future we're going to talk a lot more about urban warfare, not just what we've seen in Ukraine, but what we're likely to see in Gaza. The one thing I would say is that they're never quite the same. And, you know, the fact that the Israelis have mobilized 300,000 reservists, along with 150 plus thousand regulars, I expect these people are going to be more... um, focused and more active than perhaps some of the highly sophisticated weaponry that we've seen. But that's perhaps for another piece. Well, thank you very much for that context on the Middle East issue, Hamish. I just thought that listeners would appreciate your insights, knowing that you know the region so well. Now, returning to Ukraine, I was keen to ask for your reflections on two stories. First, we saw that one of Russia's most advanced tanks, a T-90, reported to cost four million pounds or nearly five million dollars was destroyed in fighting in the Luhansk region. What was your reaction to that? Just how advanced is this tank? Yeah, I, I think this was really interesting. I expect Dom and I could talk all day about T-90s and others. And I must say, I did have a very interesting lunch with some people the other day who, who know quite a lot about these things. Um, first of all, what struck me is is the way that this T90 and the picture was was on the Telegraph website, almost exploding into virtually nothing. This is supposed to be the most advanced tank that the Russians have. Now there are two schools of thought. I think it probably went over a mine because actually, if you if you look back at the video, you see a lot of the the blast coming up through the turret. Now, if that is the case, we know a Challenger two drove over a mine the other day and survived to tell the story. Um, If it is an anti-tank guided weapon, which which is possible as well, um, the fact that T-90s do have reactive armour, this is explosive armour that sort of blows up in in the passage of the the missile and basically disrupts it so its main force doesn't hit the tank. Now, that obviously didn't work. So it being taken out by something relatively cheap and easy, although I must say, if you look at the tank movement itself... You know, it was moving in isolation. Now, 
we all learn, whether you're in a tank or a pair of helicopters or, or, or two soldiers on the ground, you always want somebody covering you. You have one foot on the ground, as it were, as you move. Uh, as you move. Now, when we saw that T-90 moving, it seemed to be moving on its own in isolation and then drove across a major path, which, again, is is rather crass. So two things. First of all, the T-90 doesn't seem to be as swept up as, it, as we expected and really reinforcing some pretty, pretty idle, pretty slack tank crew drills. I think the other thing that I learned the other day on, on this was we were talking about the replacement for the T-90 or the alleged, the, the Almaty T-14 tank. Yeah, I, I understand there are about 14. The Russians have about 14 of these things. I understand they're hand built almost like a Rolls Royce. And the talk coming out of Moscow that they're going to up up their production, start churning these things out by, by the hundred, as it were, and the same with T90, I understand it's absolutely rubbish. They just don't have that capability. It's I think last week they were saying they were going to churn out fighter jets at, at a great speed as well after they shot a couple of their own ones down. Again, I understand that the the engineering capability and the industrial capability in, in Russia just does not allow that. So uh, that was all very interesting and reinforces, I think, that some of this kit that the Russians talk up to be so great isn't. And with the lack of the ability to train their replacement crews now, they're using it in a pretty naive way as well. Well, thank you, Hamish. I'll bring in fellow tanky Dom in a second. But just on this question of tanks, there was one other story that I wanted to ask your opinion on first, which is we've heard it articulated by one US senator that Abrams are too complex for the Ukrainians to be trained for and use. I think I can guess what you're going to say. But nonetheless, I want to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, no, I I found that pretty strange because Abrams, to me, is actually the most, it's the simplest tank I've ever been in to operate. You know, it has very similar capabilities to uh, Challenger 2 and Leopard 2, but it was designed really for American national servicemen, reservists, who can only train a couple of days a month or, um, you know, a couple of days uh, a year. And with skill fade, with any machinery, you want it really simple so that you can jump back in and use it. And that, to me, is the great thing about Abrams, to drive it. It basically has a steering wheel, and it works like an automatic car. You press the accelerator, go forward, slip it into reverse to go back, and put your foot on the brake and steer it. So from that perspective, it's dead easy. The maintenance, it's all plug and play. If something breaks down, you whip it out and put a new one in. Even has automatic track tension, as the sort of track bashing that Dom and I used to love so much is no more. You press a button and it tightens the track up. And when it comes to actually firing the gun, you basically point the gun, you know, you have an aiming spot, point point it where you want to fire and press the fire button. Challenger 2 and Leopard 2, you have to do a whole host of other things. So uh, it, it was a strange comment to me because it just strikes me that actually Abrams is a brilliant tank to give to Ukrainians because it, it is as I'm suggesting, very easy to use. I mean, it's very thirsty. It uses twice as much fuel as a as a Challenger or a Leopard. But as far as I'm aware, there is no shortage of fuel in Ukraine at the moment. It has great armour and um, it's very mobile. So there, there may be political reasons that the senator is talking about this, but the fact that there are a lot of Abrams around, there are a lot around in, in Europe, it would strike me that actually this would be a relatively easy thing for the Americans to do. But there may be other reasons behind that. Well, thanks for that context, Hamish. Dom, you've been listening to all of this conversation about tanks. Where do you stand on some of these issues? Yeah, well, I won't comment on on the how good Abrams is. I've never been in an an Abrams, so I'll I'll, uh, defer to Hamish on that one. But on the on the incident with that T-90 the other day, a number of things stood out for me. Firstly, the fact that we could see it. I mean, I know there's there's a huge number of drones and surveillance what have you over the battlefield but it's still it was very it was a very good picture so something was close to it and looking at it which which suggests it might have been a mine that that it hit if they knew but you know you're not going to cover every single mine you've you've laid with a a drone just to get a good uh, tv shot so anyway i don't know i don't know what that means i don't know where to take that sort of thought but i thought it was it was very odd that something so specific was seen in such detail but I, I do think it comes down to the skills and drills of the individual crew. For example, 
The commander was out of his turret, so you, you'd, you'd expect if you're actually in contact with the enemy, if you're firing your gun or if you're, you're likely to be anywhere near contact with the enemy, you'd be inside the turret, battened down so that nothing can get in from the outside. It just makes the whole thing much safer. Obviously, it reduces your situational awareness because you can't see so much. There are windows, for want of a better word, all the way around, episcopes, as we used to call them, but windows all the way around. So even with your turret, even with your sorry, the hatch on the turret, the commander's hatch closed, you still will be able to see around you. There's a dead spot of a few metres either side of the tank where you can't, you know, you can't crane your head basically to see down. There's always going to be a dead spot there. But, you know, unless you're in urban combat where infantry can get that close and put charges on the tank, if you're in open country, that doesn't really, um, that's not so much of an issue as long as you are, again, closely coordinated with your own infantry so you don't suddenly run them over. But the dead spots around the tank, not a massive concern. Having your hatch open, yeah, that's bigger. The second thing is that it, it was firing over its over the right hand side, not absolutely ninety degrees, but close to it. And of course, if you're in contact with the enemy, that's not the bit you want pointed at the enemy. That's not where the armor is. Most of the armor, as I said before, you, if you stand on the top of a tank with the barrel pointing forwards and you hold your arms out in a V shape of about sixty degrees, that's where the armor is on the front of the turret and the front of the hull, and about a third of the way down the sides. Obviously, it differs for different tanks and different countries and what have you. But the thing's not going to move if it's absolutely covered with armour. So you've got to put it at the bit that's most likely to get hit. And that's generally the, the front and the, the, the forward third. So the sides are very vulnerable. So is the back and the belly and the and the top. So if you're actually in contact, and this thing was, or it was certainly firing its, its main armament, and then it got hit by something. So, you know, it was in it was in contact with the Ukrainians. You would have expected to have its hull pointed forward towards them. Unless, of course, it's dashing to another position of cover. And this thing clearly wasn't. It stopped on the track. It sort of jiggled around a bit. Then you see the commander pop up and have a look about. All the while, with, the, with the, they got about two rounds off. So unless something had gone wrong or they just weren't very well trained, then it, it, it's, it was not the way you'd, you'd ideally want to operate as a tank crew. I think it was probably the latter. They just weren't, they weren't very well trained. I don't think something had gone wrong. And I think it speaks of trying to rush people into service, get them on on these vehicles. I'm surprised if on on the, some of the most modern equipment, a T90, that you wouldn't have your best trained crews. But it, it looked to me as if it was just very poor drills by that crew at that at that time. Yeah, having the hatch open, being sighted onto the enemy, and not moving—all fairly basic stuff. So. Yeah, I, it, I think they, they paid the price. As for what hit it, if it was a mine, an anti-tank guided weapon or a or another tank's main armament, the main armament of another tank that would go much faster than an anti-tank guided weapon. So it has the potential to to perforate the turret, and not just penetrate and get inside and chuck stuff around, almost as if a shotgun's gone off. If you get inside a turret, the blast can chuck bits of metal and all the kit around, and that's what will you know, destroy the tank and, and kill the crew. A tank main armament doesn't actually have any explosive on it so the idea is to perforate the turret go in one side and out the other and the overpressure that's caused by that will ignite the charges that are in there or basically try and suck everything out that's in inside the turret try and get it out the, the hole it's just gone through it creates a, a small vacuum behind it it's going so fast so quite what it was i'm not sure what what what, uh, what hit it but it was the drills that really stood out for me Thanks, Dom. And just staying with you, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but for the benefit of listeners who perhaps haven't been following the tank war as intimately as we all have for so many months now, where would you say that we stand? You know, where does Russia stand? Where does Ukraine stand as far as tanks are concerned? There was so much conversation months ago around Rammstein about the delivery of tanks and how they could be a game changer. That hasn't quite taken place seemingly without the air support which of course we were talking about today but in broad terms where do you think we stand on the tank war at this moment does it favor kiev does it claim russia or do you think it's it's fairly balanced well i think it's fairly balanced because they can't move and if they are denied so a tank is is the combination of three military factors firepower mobility and protection that's what it is so basically what everything you want to do on a, on a battlefield are, are those three things you want to fire move and protect yourself the tank is the embodiment of that 
Now, if it's denied its movement because there's a massive great minefield in front of you or there's a, a lattice work of anti-tank guided weapon inf- infantry teams, then you know if it's just got protection of firepower, that, 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 that's fine, but it doesn't actually do an awful lot. So I think at the moment we, we, haven't, we haven't seen tanks do what they are able to do. We, we haven't, I don't think we've seen that at all, actually. There's been no kind of big, open, armoured engagements, even at the, at the very start. Of, um, of the full-scale invasion, we saw those l- columns of tanks that were then hit by the Ukrainian columns of Russian tanks hit by the Ukrainian um, anti-tank teams that were that were crawling about them. Tanks have to work in very close proximity with the infantry. Tanks can't look after themselves; they can't hold ground. Infantry hold ground; the tanks don't. So they have to work very closely together. So Russia used them as a as a big fist, a big metal fist to punch through somewhere by weight of numbers they don't really go for that kind of knitting together with the infantry thing so as that has become a a much greater demand we've seen how russia just their doctrine is not suited to that and it's taken ukraine well we've not seen them adequately try it yet because they haven't had the forces to do it with the um with the, the the time it's taken the tanks to go in when you're talking about the when earlier at Ramstein and elsewhere, the importance of the tanks going, it was more. It was just as symbolic as it was physical. I think it unlocked for many people because these are big old hulking beasts. You know, sixty, fifty, sixty tons. Um, I think it unlocked something in the political corridors of power that said that they were up for it, up for the support of Ukraine, it, even though you might have been might have had more effect against the Russians with the anti-air and anti-tank missiles that were being sent out i think symbolically they were so so important and that unlocked something um, we know that ukraine tried to use tanks in a as we say combined arms warfare of all the different bits of the military um, military machine working together they tried that at the start of this counter-offensive and just w- ran straight into all the minefields and so they w- they've never been able to really get that going so i don't think we've seen it as it as it should be at the tank but i think at the moment because of the density of minefields and Ukraine's plan, they've not tried to push everywhere all at once. We've we've simply not we've not seen it do what it should do. But I know Hamish is going to have some comments to uh, to add on to this. Well, absolutely. I was going to go next to Hamish. You've been listening to what Dom was saying there. His analysis. What are your reflections on it, Hamish? Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with every, everything Dom said there. I think I, I've just had two points to this. And it's really the, the difference between the Soviet Russian tanks and Western tanks. On both sides, predominantly the Russians, they have lost thousands and thousands of T-72s, T-80s, even T-90s and T-64Bs and probably also T-55s. But on the Western tanks, the Leopard 2s, Challenge 2s, it's in the single finger numbers that have been lost. I mean, these the Challenge 2 and, and Leopard have been hit like that T-90 was and have survived and have been recovered and, and repaired. So it's really showing the very much higher quality of kit that that's the Western kit in the hands of the Ukrainians. What would I absolutely agree? I mean, that everything has got bogged down in the massive Sorovkin defensive line, which is it's very difficult to describe, you know, 20, 30 miles deep of a very dense mixed minefields covered by fire with trenches. It's a huge challenge. I think when when they break through and there are some positive noises, it, it is when the, the, the t- tank, the armoured manoeuvre will come into its own because I expect once they get into into southern Ukraine, northern, into the sort of Crimea area, actually the tanks can move very rapidly. And actually it's not just the tanks. If you look at the Bradleys, the arm, American armoured fighting vehicles, the Marders and others, they have been really able to soak up a lot of punishment, which the B- BRDMs and BMPs, which are the Russian troop carriers, have not been able to. So... It's. I expect a lot. People thought this was a battle-winning kit. I absolutely agree with Dom. It's more psychological than not. It's a bit like the F-16s when they come online, they will make a difference. So, that their time will come. I, I, and again, we we could talk about tanks for ages and ages and ages. But I think w- what what is fascinating. Uh, my final word would be: I I commanded the first Royal Tank Regiment, and our, our forebears fought it in the first major tank battle at Cambrai in in nineteen November twentieth and November nineteen seventeen. 
the sort of stuff they did then is virtually no different to the sort of stuff that Ukrainians are doing now over 100 years later. So I, I expect, and I would say this is a tanky, and I'm sure my infantry chums and air corps chums and RAF chums, and I have a few RAF chums, of course, w- would be saying this is the end of the tank. But yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if something that we call a tank is still operating in a hundred years' time. Well, thank you both very much for that conversation. It's time for our final thoughts. We will have an interview segment in a moment. Dom Nichols, what are your final thoughts for today? Thanks, Francis. I've been reflecting on the comments by Jake Sullivan, the U.S. National Security Advisor, who, who was saying yesterday that, that the, the U.S. has the capacity to think about two two things at once. It can it can look at and think about and plan and supply um, weapons to Israel at the same time as doing that for Ukraine. But I thought it was interesting that he felt the need to say that there is this idea, there's this conversation piece that Russia are keen to push, but they've not. They've, there are many many other people saying the same thing about this diversion of attention. I don't see in the events in Israel, I don't see Russian fingerprints all over it. I see them giving huge support to Iran, obviously. Iran gives support to Hamas. I see the diversion, possible diversion of international attention being of benefit to Russia. But I don't see some Machiavellian sort of strings from Hamas up to Putin. However, if there is a diversion of attention or just others trying to trying to take advantage of, of any potential there, then I think we need to keep our eye out for that. So there's still a lot of tension happening in Serbia, Kosovo, which is much more directly impacted by Russia. But uh, in terms of what is going to make the, the world look elsewhere and have all of us get absolutely fatigued by by the state of things at the moment, I wouldn't be surprised if, if there was a little bit of argy-bargy there stimulated by Russia to try and see what would happen. And I would also look further afield. So China's relationship with Russia has been under close scrutiny through the extent of this full-scale invasion. We know Russia has wanted China to send ammunition and arms and weapons and what have you. And they've they've only, if they've done any at all, China, we think it's exceptionally low key, dip your toe in the water, rip just ammunition, you know, small scale, small arms ammunition rather than anything, anything big. They've really not wanted to get their hand in the mangle. However, what they might do is work something on the diplomatic front that would also work for them. So I would also keep an eye on, on Taiwan and any provocative action in the Taiwan Strait and possibly any exercises that come up or any other action there by China that might just raise the heat a little bit there that would suit both them uh, and potentially Russia if, it, if there is credence this idea that, that, that the world only has a certain attention span and it can't look everywhere at once. I don't happen to believe that, but I think others will at least at least examine the possibility of that. So yeah, I would keep an eye on the Western Balkans and uh, and the Taiwan Strait. Well, thanks, Tom. And also looking out for Africa as well. Of course, there have been numerous coups there recently, which is also a cause for concern and potential distraction too. Subject for another day. Hamish de Breton Gordon. Yeah, I think my, my final thought today is about disinformation and propaganda. I've been absolutely staggered by the amount of rubbish coming out of the MFA, the Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs recently. It is just a torrent of complete and utter garbage. And uh, we've already mentioned Medyev. He is spurting even more ridiculous stuff virtually every day. But some people might have seen a fake BBC video yesterday purporting that arms given to Ukraine by the West have been sold on the black market to Hamas, which is complete bonkers. In fact, it claims that my good friends at Bellingcat, the open source information website, published this, but they have absolutely refuted it. And and I do do follow Bellingcat. They are a real honest brokers in all this. So my, my sort of thought is do try and sort, sort out the wheat from the chaff here. Basically, if it's coming from a Russian embassy account, unless it's a Russian embassy WSE parody account, it is probably diametrically opposed to the truth. Now, as you'll have heard yesterday, David has spent the beginning of this week at the Labour Party conference, trying to establish how the UK's official opposition party would approach support for Ukraine if they were to win next year's general election. Also in attendance at Liverpool was Ukrainian MP Oleksandr Kornienko, and David sat down with him to discuss his hopes for continued British support. Here's their conversation. 
I'm Alexander Karnienko. I'm first deputy chairman of Verkhovna Rada. It's Ukrainian parliament. Uh, previously, I was uh, head of the party Servant of People. It's part of uh, Zelensky uh, president. And uh, I met Zelensky at his election company and his headquarter, election election headquarter. And I helped helped him to build first in the history of Ukrainian elections volunteer uh, network of observer to elections because we hadn't enough resources like some oligarchs to to join our company. In previous life I wasn't a politician, I was entrepreneur in field of education people, of uh, business education. I had company in this area, but from 2006 I work with any politicians on different elections. That's why I have such experience, but from another side. And why have you come to Labour Party conference? The Labour Party is our very big friends of Ukraine. It's friendship party. Of course, we are very appreciate of bipartial support in House of Commons, in UK in general, and of course, it's very important to, to us to communicate with. Uh, all sides of UK politics, especially we have one one condition that it's more close to my participation here. We ha- in Ukraine we haven't sister fam- sister party, sister unity party in the family of SD, where Labour Party situated in the family of socialists. We haven't in Parliament exactly. That's why pre- members of uh, Presidium of Parliament, uh, me or my colleague uh, Speaker or other Vice Speaker, joined these events. When, when we have a representation from the Sister Unity Party. That's why it's some, some honor for me to, to be here in Liverpool, because, uh, of course, I music fan, and for me it's city something special, and not only because of Beatles, but because of uh, near-situated Manchester here, and I think it, it's two of the great cities in the music history of 20th century. Uh, and, of course, for us it's possibility to promote our messages. I will give floor on main stage uh, tomorrow. I took part in uh, some side events. We discussed, we promote. We have very beautiful reception in international lounge. Uh, we taking part of shadow ministers. And very good opportunity to promote our very important senses and narratives once more in so warm auditory. Labour say that there will be a total continuity of support for Ukraine if they win the next election in the UK. Did you believe them tonight? We, we haven't any choice. We haven't any choice. We need to believe uh, to all UK politicians because the UK for us it's no, not only so close, it's not only so biggest, but even a uh, pi- pioneering partner because uh, most of the decisions that was uh, making, that was made in our partners and is making in now, started from London. Uh, I talked about long-range missiles like Shadow Storm. I'm talking about anti-ship people, anti-ship missiles that support us to change the uh, situation in Black Sea area. I talk about 10 coalitions that started from London, also from the decision of Challenger, etc., etc. And that's why, of course, it's about humanitarian support, it's about budget support, of course. That's why we believe in our future close relationship with UK in terms of any winner of next elections. Of course, like international partners, we can't agitate against of in favor or any party of course our representatives was were on a, a meeting of conservative party of course we, we, we are working in terms of absolutely be part multi party support of ukraine but we believe in all promises we believe in all warm words but on the other hand of course it will be depend of internal situation in uk also and uh, all uh, dis- all discuss that discusses that are go, going uh, here are very interesting for us uh, in terms of our uh, internal agenda also because uh, at the end of the day after win after end of war we also need need to change our model of country we're going to be member of EU we're going to member of uh, NATO and we need to do much more in terms of our internal reform. 
And uh, if we talk in very, I don't know, in very simple uh, characteristics, uh, we also have inside Ukraine the same discussion between some social democratic approach like Labour Party and some more right liberal approach like Tory here, like Conservative Party. And that's why we all time on, on the way of choosing how Ukraine will will go on in the future. That's why it's very important discussion for us also. They going on right now. For example, we had law about the regulation of privatization process. And we had filibuster, we have amendments, we have meetings in parliament against that because we have parties that are very strong against open markets in our parliament also. It's called Bob Batkyushina, it's opposition. That's why it's, for us it's a very important part of discussion. Of course, internal will, uh, will, will be play a role and will be, I don't know, we will, will be take very great uh, influence to external. And it will be a big, big, big uh, picture of, from all of that puzzles. Well, can I ask you a little bit about internal Ukrainian politics? We've spoken, obviously, to representatives from your party, from Sluha Narodu, and also from some of the opposition parties. And I've heard from some of them some concerns that they weren't, they felt like they weren't being listened to in the national government, in the war efforts. And some of them talked about not being able to leave the country to represent Ukraine when they wanted to. What's your response to that? Here on, on uh, this meeting you can meet with uh, Alexei Gencherenko from uh, opposition party European Solidarity, it's party of Poroshenko. Poroshenko personally now in Brussels. I think it's an answer to all these concerns. It's not problem with any traveling by business, but by rest it's problem because uh, according to our decision of uh, National Council of Security and Defense, all state uh, men, not only MPs, it, uh, we're talking about um, uh, 200,000 state men on different levels, local authorities, mm. all, everybody, everyone, uh, can't uh, go abroad uh, without any business uh, permission from the state body. That's why if you need to work with other parliament, if you need to work in parliament assembly like uh, parliament assembly of Council of Europe, parliament assembly of C, parliament assembly of NATO, when we had uh, two days ago very, very great uh, impact and very great delegation with Poroshenko also inside and uh, some guys from other opposition parties. It's all work, but you need to understand one of the very important condition right now after two years of one and a half year of war and without possibility to go on abroad all men of Ukraine it's problematic to communicate to understand in uh, our population what is going on when statements go on abroad it's some like ecological and moral moment it's some, uh, we had very, very dramatic cases when our um, former MPs go in bro- go st- started to go in abroad to their private interest, to rest on Maldives. And of course after that society was uh, fired. And we need to, 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 to establish these uh, new rules to, 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 to make this more clear, to make this more manageable. In terms of all uh, other our uh, situation in Parliament, for example, I will give you a very simple example. Uh, last week we, we had in Parliament a budget, one of the budget law, and our position uh, colleagues proposed about 700 amendments. It took place and we had these amendments for more than 11 hours. And after 11 hours of this process, we will we voted this budget law, and it was very okay. And it was with all TV translation supported it in open regime, and etc. Cetera, et cetera. That's why I think we we give a possibility, we give law to all opposition actions in parliament, outside the parliament. We have possibility to communicate them on our special news marathon of on TV that started from the first day of school with full-scale invasion. But uh, you need to understand that in terms of some more, more intensive uh, internal discussion and like election discussion, 
we can't do it right now because we can't do election and that's why it's very huge uh, risks to our political and society system to start some fighting against each other because all Ukrainian lessons from history was about united in hard times. We lost our country in the start of 20th century because of because of uh, broken united between uh, key, key players in that time and USSR occupied it, our territory at that time. And it was in history many times, in 60th century, and in, tw- in 12th century. It's a common Ukrainian issue of united politicians, united society in hard times. Now, it seems like we learned this lesson. That's why we need to keep this united and to keep in touch and to keep more closely, to build this confidence between each other, etc., etc. And finally, what's your message to our listeners around the world, and especially here in Britain, since we're at the we're in Liverpool at the Labour Party conference? These guys could be the next government of the UK. What's your message to them? For one hand, we are very grateful to support, very thankful for support, for previous support, and uh, as I said, every ballot matters, every penny matters, every family who hosts refugees matters. Every vote from Parliament Tribune matters. All that you did matters. But we need to keep this support in the future because we need additional ammunition, we need additional missiles, we need to promote our program of supporting refugees, we need to promote our program of support Ukrainian economy, and of course we need to promote all our international agenda that is especially Labour Party supported much more. It's I'm talking about establishment establish special war crime tribunal of crime of aggression Russian Federation against Ukraine are talking about reforming of UN of reforming of Secretary Council of reforming of UN General Assembly are talking about sanction policy and to make sa- sanctions stronger and to make sanctions real because we see enough of sanction tricky from the Russia side and of course, they, they can produce uh, missiles, up, up to 50 missiles in a month. It's a very awful, <laughs> awful thing for us. And, uh, of course, it all projects of our bilateral collaboration in terms of building country, in terms of some uh, trying to use in Russian frozen assets to rebuild in, uh, our country, and uh, to establish some insurance for example, for ships, but of course for all business who will want to, to build something in Ukraine in that hard time. Of course, the main issue is their defensive because it started new wave of Shahid's attack to Ukraine, to harbors, and to infrastructure of Odessa region. And of course, it's issue of all support and way and all kinds that, that we can as long as you can, as long as you want, but we will fight to the win and uh, we will can as long as we can. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk slash Ukraine The Latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine Live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. We've also started doing the same for what is unfolding in the Middle East. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Just follow The Telegraph on Twitter so that you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do please refer to podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. As the disinformation war ramps up, we're relying on your support more than ever. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. 
You can also contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we're especially interested to hear where you're listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was today produced by Giles Gear. Executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.